Hello and welcome back. Projections of inflation and the risks surrounding them are a key part of how monetary policy is conducted. Yet when times are unpredictable and uncertainty mounts, forecasts can struggle to provide enough information to policymakers. Forecasting becomes all the more difficult when economists are faced with measuring the impact of extraordinary events such as the pandemic and Russia's unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Both those events, as we know well, have led to price pressures shooting up and despite estimates that the shocks would prove short-lived, they've sadly proven anything but. This panel will ask experts from central banks and multilateral organizations how the processes and techniques used by economists can best adapt to a volatile inflation environment. It will be chaired by Philip Lane, member of the executive board of the European Central Bank. Mr. Lane, over to you. Th thank you, Claire. So in, in the last session, th I think there was some uh, discussion of the uncertainty about understanding what's already happened. Uh, but when we're trying to understand what might happen in the future, uh, you know, the uncertainty takes a different form. Uh, as Claire said, I mean, forecasting is, is a, a very central component of monetary policy. Uh, we know there are lags in the transmission of monetary policy, uh, and so it's, it's inescapable. Uh, and then uh, the question is, when you're forecasting, do you actually have a forecasting process, or do you use rules of thumb or intuition, gut feeling, uh, uh, and so on, and obviously uh, there's a balancing act. It's good to have a machine, it's good to have a regular forecasting process, but ideally you want that machine to be sufficiently agile that indeed, as Claire said, when there's a extraordinary shocks and so on, that it can adapt. That in turn uh, leads to the balance between uh, using the models versus using judgment, and in fact some blend of modeling and judgment in, in creating forecasts uh, and then maybe a very important issue, because I mean, I think it's important for this panel ideally to, uh, if you like, forecast the future of forecasting, not just have a retrospective about what just happened. And a fundamental issue is going to be, is what just happened basically a, a, you know, a collection of black swans, uh, very big, but they don't necessarily uh, define uh, you know, the, the future in the same way. Will we go back to having a more regular business cycle or indeed, uh, do we have to think harder about structural change? So uh, I think uh, we've assembled, uh, I think, a, a fantastic panel. Uh, what's partly interesting from my point of view, it, it mixes uh, multilateral organizations where you have the conundrum of forecasting the aggregate as well as forecasting individual countries. And we the, uh, in the Euro system have that issue. Uh, but we also have, have uh, people involved uh, from, from uh, well, I was going to say a unified United Kingdom, um, but of course, uh, having the Bank of England as the Bank of the United Kingdom is, is very important, and of course, uh, with the Fed. So it's, it's a great panel. Uh, I'm under severe uh, instructions to finish on time, uh, given uh, the rest of the agenda. So, so uh, I, will, I will be a tough timekeeper, I hope. Uh, so let's start with Alfred. So Alfred, over to you. Yep. So I uh, will, will discuss uh, some of the uh, common uh, challenges that we are facing in uh, assessing, whoops, assessing uh, the uh, developments and to project the economy uh, and how we have been dealing with that in the IMF. I will uh, structure my remarks uh, uh, in three themes. Uh, first, the challenges we were facing and how we uh, approached it at the IMF. Then I will go into the issue of how we adapted our forecasting uh, methods during these uncertain times, especially with regard to how we dealt with it during the pandemic and now during the energy crisis. And uh, finally, I will conclude with uh, what lessons we can take forward. The three lessons. Uh, first lesson is be balanced. And that means uh, when uh, we are doing our forecasts, we need to uh, be balanced with regard to uh, how to incorporate common factors, which are across countries, 
and uh, also taking into account the idiosyncratic country-specific issues and the plumbing of countries and how uh, things will affect the country in particular. The second issue is, uh, the, the second lesson is be nimble. Be ready to continuously develop and add new tools. And that's something we have been doing during the pandemic as well as during the uh, energy crisis. And the final lessons uh, for us uh, that we learned is be modest. Focus on avoiding misses that would cause major policy mistakes and uh, live with marginal variation around the model forecast. So those are the uh, three lessons we had. So macroeconomic uh, forecasting is difficult at the best of times. Uh, as you all know, we are dealing with economies which are complex social systems. We take stock occasionally of our forecast performance and we compare our performance to also other uh, uh, forecasters. And what we find is that we are fairly good at short horizons and that means one year. And as soon as you go out uh, even one and a half or two years, the uh, forecast uh, is deteriorating fairly quickly. That applies to the IMF as well as to other forecasters. And the reason is that uh, economies are suffer constant shocks. And I should also say we see uh, policy changes that we uh, did not expect. Another insight we have uh, with regard to forecast is that the higher the volatility of GDP in a country, the larger the forecast error. And on a side note, when we are adjusting uh, for higher vol volatility, the forecast error is the same for low income countries or for advanced economies. We had some big shocks over the last few years which made uh, forecasting in particularly challenging. And many of the macroeconomic relationships uh, broke down during the pandemic. Think about Okun's law, the link between unemployment and output that weakened because of job retention schemes. It also weakened because there was a preference uh, to work fewer hours uh, during the week. Think about our famous story on excess savings of the past year. Essentially, that represents a breakdown of a historically very tight relationship between household uh, disposable income and consumption, as you can see in the left chart. And another challenge uh, we faced uh, during the energy crisis was the massive volatility in energy markets since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The right chart shows the breakdown of this relationship that between Russian oil and Russian gas prices in 2022. So what does this all imply for forecasting? One question is the trade-off between focusing on country-specific factors versus common forces. And what do we mean by that? When uh, we are doing our projections at the IMF uh, in the World Economic Outlook, this is a bottom-up exercise uh, done by 190 country teams. They are starting to work on their country forecast, uh, looking and assuming a number of key global variables, such as commodity prices and benchmark interest rates. In the forecast round we are undertaking then, we perform many checks to ensure cross-country consistency in how these assumptions are incorporated. And that is an iterative process. That's not just uh, a, a one-time exercise. But important to note that country teams have substantial discretion, including in terms of deciding how much their economy is affected by a common factor, embedding country-specific information in their forecast, and also importantly, the tools and the models they are using. Giving country experts room to incorporate idiosyncratic factor is crucial because what we know is that domestic factors tend to be more important than foreign ones for the path of economic activity on average. But it's also true when we do ex post evaluations, we find that common components are not sufficiently taken into account as they could be and should be. Especially during uh, times of large global or regional shocks, 
the common factor can be dominant enough to justify a more top-down approach to forecasting. As this chart shows, on the left side you see the uh, GFC where we were off uh, and our uh, forecast was too positive. We were off uh, in our initial forecast to the pandemic, but in between the years uh, the forecast errors were uh, nicely distributed uh, around uh, zero. To give uh, a concrete example, during the early months of the pandemic, it became clear that the expected <coughs> progression of infections, mobility restrictions, and the sensitivity of output to mobility would dominate the immediate outlook. Translating these qualitative factors into a quantitative forecast faced three challenges. First, when we did our March 20 spring VO outlook, we knew and saw that infections were clustered around some countries but we had no idea uh, how these infections would actually percolate through the world economy. And uh, we didn't know how highly that uh, virus uh, and contagious it was and how quickly it would spread. Second, it was unclear how severe the mobility restrictions would be in different countries. And third, there was little historical data to extrapolate how economic activity would respond to such restrictions. We decided uh, to take a uh, centralized approach, engaged with uh, epidemiologists, uh, we consulted on how the virus would be spreading. We then made an assumption on, uh, depending on the economic structure, that most contact intensive uh, share of uh, activity in a country would matter more for a particular country, and we translated that into loss days of uh, uh, GDP. Uh, we uh, added domestic disruptions, country teams factored in impact of international demand and supply spillovers. And finally, based on available policy space, we factored in offsetting policy uh, support. Overall, uh, this uh, uh, did quite well. Uh, with the same year forecast, we made it in spring 2020 for the euro area being off only by about one percentage points, not a large error given how massive the shock was. Sorry, the elephant, uh, the elephant in the room. Ah, I'm one slide ahead. Yeah, the elephant in the room, uh, with repeated underestimation of inflation over the past one and a half years, points to the need of being nimble. And you see uh, how off we were uh, from these charts. And uh, of course, we know that the pandemic supply shocks were unpredictable. But even when the shocks materialized, it was challenging to quantify their effects on inflation. Forecast errors were large. We uh, highlight two specific shortcomings of our models and how we try to improve them. The first issue is about the right amount of granularity. Most of our forecasting was previously done using international oil prices as proxy for overall energy prices. This worked well in the past, uh, it did not work well when gas prices shot up and Russia, uh, uh, because Russia cut off gas to Europe. Now allowing gas prices to end the inflation projection separately, thus was a problem for projecting energy inflation and ultimately the pass through from energy to core inflation. We now project inflation more disaggregated as you can see uh, in this chart. The second key shortcoming and much harder to correct has to do with non-linearities firms might not react strongly to a 20 percentage point increase in prices of one of the minor inputs, but that changes when uh, that input is increasing by 500 points. And the models missed the marks because these movements were well out of range and these models were not trained uh, based on these parameters. So forecasting is a humbling process. What lessons can we apply going forward? First, an enhanced role for top-down guidance will probably stay with us at the IMF. That helps react in real time to important developments, which in a possibly more shock-prone world could prove important. But we need to be balanced. Idiosyncratic fact, uh, factors, country-specific information matters. Second, be nimble. We need to continuously monitor and enhance our tools. Part of the way forward is also to exploit underused data sources and incorporating new data including big data in a flexible way. And finally, 
we should be modest. Macroeconomic data remains difficult to collect, notably GDP, and GDP, as you all know, is prone to large revisions. De-emphasize point estimates and focus on forecast ranges, especially when forecasting informs policy making. Avoid forecast errors that would yield gross policy mistakes. Scenario analysis has a clear role to play, allowing both to implement policies to avoid a downside scenario and do contingency planning. And that's what we also did uh, with regard to the Russian gas shutoff when we came out that this would be a deep incision in, in, in growth. And that triggered policy reactions and actually took care of uh, the potential deep recession in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. And the, the, the next speaker will be from the OECD. I hand over to Claire. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me to speak on this today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how the OECD approached forecasting over the last few eventful years and what lessons there are from that. Before we get to the substance, uh, just a short intro on what we actually do in this space. So we publish four sets of projections each year, two economic outlooks, which do projections across a range of variables for every member country of the OECD and then selected non-member countries. Um, and we do two interim outlooks between those which provide basically updates on inflation and GDP for the G20 countries that we, that we consider. So we've got 38 member countries Mostly, but not exclusively, those are high-income countries. And added to that, we do projections for another 10 countries, including China, India, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, and some others. Um, like we've heard from the IMF, it's a, an iterative process. We have country desks that produce individual country projections, and then we have a central top-down set of guidelines and a common narrative that ties that together, the individual country projections together into a global picture with consistent trade numbers. A key part of our process is we have a set of committee meetings where we discuss the projections with member countries. So every central bank and finance ministry comes along and uh, we take comments from them into account. We don't agree them with countries and, and in some, some instances quite far from, they're quite far from agreed. Um, I've been using the word projections rather than forecast. What we do is we take a set of assumptions and we produce a modal projection based on those assumptions. As an international organization, we have um, the luxury, I would say, of being able to take quite a flexible approach to how we treat assumptions, including assumptions around policy. And I think that's quite important. So we can adapt our approach to circumstances. Uh, and we do that so it focuses on, on what the most sort of relevant issue of the day is. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, we're telling basically a story about what could happen under that set of assumptions in, a, in an internally consistent way both within countries and across countries. And what we're doing is really aiming to make recommendations on appropriate economic policies. So, for example, we might choose not to assume a fiscal response in response to a shock. Uh, we would then show some projections about the growth pros prospects. That might lead governments to change their fiscal policy and dis uh, boost discretionary spending, for example. And so you'd see a growth outturn quite different from the one that we, we projected. Um, obviously, for policy-making institutions, they're arguably much more constrained in how they treat policy. Uh, you know, if you're both the user and the producer in that sense of a forecast, it's slightly different, different task. And that, of course, complicates the task in terms of producing the forecast and communicating it and its role in policy decision making. And just move on. If we look at projection errors, um, obviously what matters is why they have happened. So there's useful information in them that you can, you can learn from. You can see here the, projection, the errors, the OECD projections of the last 50 years. Uh, the picture is very similar to other macro forecasting institutions. And, and as Alfred said, you know, as you'd expect, errors are greatest around major crises. We never have a tail event in our central scenarios. You know, a pandemic, a war, an earthquake. It's, um, you, know, it's, you, ne you never have that before it's happened in your scenarios. Um, and again, you can see here that the decay rate on the accuracy is very, very rapid. Uh, looking ahead even by a further sort of six or 12 months, you can see it makes quite a difference. Um, in the case of the most two recent large shocks that I'll talk about, show you a bit more detail what we did, COVID and the Ukraine war, two things in particular were underappreciated in the projections. One was just the resilience 
of economic agents and how economies adapted, and the other was the scale and the impact of fiscal policy. So how to deal with exceptional events um, and highlight uncertainties that policy policymakers face. Uh, so in exceptional circumstances, what the OECD did uh, is describe its projections as bimodal. So um, if you think, we've, what I've shown you here on, on the left-hand side is what we did uh, in June 2020. If you think back, that was obviously a really challenging time to do projections. At the time, many economies were in lockdown um, in response to the pandemic, and the debate at the time was all around what would happen when they reopened and whether or not they would need to be closed down again. And so um, the OECD decided to produce a bimodal forecast at that point with two growth scenarios. As you can see here, one you know, that had, had the single lockdown and one that had another one later in the year, um, basically because this was dominating every other issue if, at, the, at the time. Another thing that we did, you can see on the right-hand side, was around using data to track what was, what was going on. Lots of people did this, but of course lockdowns and restrictions meant that the usual relationships were um, very difficult. You know, we're not holding, it's very difficult to interpret this, and of course inf official data comes with quite a long lag. So we produced a tracker based on high frequency data, mobility data, container ships, Google Trends, internet searches, the like, and we used machine learning tools to develop that into a GDP tracker, and you can see on the right-hand side um, its, its performance there. Moving on to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, so we did an interim set of projections uh, the week after the invasion, so the first week of March. Um, obviously, uncertainty at that point was huge, and actually we decided not to publish a detailed set of projection numbers, but rather to highlight the risks and the exposures through different channels. So we looked at energy, food, refugees, and the like, and what the OECD did was produce macroeconomic model estimates of the potential effects, and you can see that on the left-hand side. The example you see is a global simulation of GDP impacts of the war. We also did inflation. Um, and the potential to offset these impacts through fiscal policy responses, such as those cushioning the effect of energy price uh, spikes. I'll pause briefly here on the treatment of fiscal policy. It's an issue that's come up a bit in the discussion yesterday and, and this morning, and it's worth pausing on what we can learn from the experience of, of this in in terms of forecasting, there's quite important questions about who, how fiscal policy is included. Typically, this is done after it's been announced, but in recent crises, there have been points when it's been very clear that a fiscal response would be forthcoming in some form, but not the detail of it. And then, so it's worth thinking about how to think about that and anticipate it. It becomes really important for both forecasting and, of course, for monetary policy decision-making, though, though very tricky. Um, there's then a question about how we model the, fiscal Im the impact of fiscal policy. In the last few years, what we've seen is the policy's become much more active and quite a bit more creative, we saw in the discussion earlier. And it's not just about scale, but also about policy design. Different types can have quite different impacts on, on growth and inflationary effects. Some obviously are directly on prices, as was discussed earlier, um, where you, know, you can calculate a very arithmetic impact on inflation. More traditionally, we think about fiscal policy in terms of the impact on demand, including through job retention, uh, you know, job retention or transfers to households. And of course, it can also affect supply. Generally, that's a longer-term phenomenon, but not exclusively. And some fiscal policy can have a short-term impact on supply, particularly some labor market policy. Um, just briefly on the right-hand side, I've shown another example of some innovative tracking that we did around risks. As part of the OECD projections in 2021, we did some simulations of European gas reserves. Um, and that's an example, basically, of how when shocks become quite complex, uh, economics can adapt and learn quite a lot from other disciplines and apply some of that. So here, using energy expertise, obviously, there was quite a lot of work around epidemiological expertise in the, in the pandemic and how you build that in. Obviously, weather and climate modeling will be the other area work that will expand in this space. Um, but despite learning lots, obviously, uh, we have to be humble. Um, you can see here, you know, we, like everyone else, has consistently underestimated how persistent inflation would be as this shock has fed through. This on the left-hand side is the OECD version of the chart that Gita showed Monday evening. It's, it's the same story. Um, like others, we're investigating further aspects of the inflation persistence and what we've learned, including around profit shares and how those rose early on in some sectors. Um, and, the sp and the space there then for those profits to absorb some wage rises going forward. We've also seen in many countries it takes longer to bring inflation down when all countries are acting simultaneously, tightening monetary policy. 
the exchange rate channel is limited. There's obviously a lot of uncertainty that we still don't understand the role of inflation expectations, how they're formed, particularly after a very long period of low inflation, the questions about the labour market and whether unemployment is still the best indicator of slack post-pandemic when we've seen quite substantial structural changes to labour markets and, as I say, the, the size and the time of the fiscal policy. Um, I'll show you what's on the, on the right-hand side here just because, um, following what Alfred said, we obviously do detailed forecasts across a range of countries. Um, we had a look at whether or not there are any patterns to the errors there, um, looking at it you know, by individual country, size, characteristics, those sorts of things, income. Very hard to see any pattern at all. What you can see here is if you cut it by country blocks, kind of what you'd expect, which is you know where the shocks hit look more largely, the errors are larger. I'll just conclude then with um, three points, really. So one is when you're facing novel shocks or particular uncertainties, scenarios can be really helpful in teasing out the impacts of particular assumptions. And in some cases, they can be more informative than running full forecasts. Second, um, we need to think quite carefully about fiscal policy and how we handle it, particularly as fiscal authorities have become more activist in the response to recent shocks um, and have applied fiscal policies in, in different ways, and that's likely to continue. Uh, and finally, the importance of improving and updating our tools and the data that we use, including borrowing from other disciplines where this can help us with particular shocks. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, and now we, we switch uh, to Hugh Pill from the Bank of England. So good morning, everyone. Uh, let me also say thank you very much for inviting me to this excellent conference, and it's a pleasure to be part of such a distinguished panel. Uh, so I want to make three points. Um, first of all, I think I want to acknowledge the difficulties that have been faced in forecasting inflation in recent times. And to do that, I'm going to show you um, an MPC forecast published in the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Report from the spring of 2021. Uh, I mean, given our role and given the lags in transmission, this is a forecast that is probably relevant for policy considerations um, at the turn of this year. So as Sylvana said yesterday, uh, the Bank of England has a long history of emphasizing the uncertainty around forecasts and downplaying central projections and reflecting the views coming out of the forecast process in a fan chart. And that fan chart is quite wide. So uh, the outlook for CPI inflation uh, for 95% confidence is plus or minus six percentage points. And yet, as you can see in the chart, we have managed to overshoot that quite significantly and in quite a persistent way. Now, it's quite well-trodden ground to discuss what the implications and causes of that are, so I will come back to that in a second. But it, I think it's also important or interesting to think about what the discussion around this forecast was. And the discussion around this forecast centered on what would happen to that accumulation of excess saving or money overhang that Daniel described yesterday. And the concern was, the risk was, um, that there may be a consumption boom that is coming from the uh, spending of that accumulated saving, which would be inflationary. But what I think is sort of important to keep in mind there is, again, as Salvana said yesterday, is that we have not seen that consumption boom in the UK. So on this measure of consumption, not only has UK household consumption not reattained its pre uh, the level that would be implied by a continuation of the trend pre-pandemic, it hasn't yet achieved the level uh, that we saw prior to the pandemic. Um, and of course, the reason for that is one that has been at the center of lots of the discussions we've had over the last few days, namely that we saw a very big and significant shock to energy prices, in particular to European natural gas prices, on which the UK energy system is particularly uh, dependent, following from uh, the invasion of Ukraine. And as I think this chart shows, that shock was both pretty unprecedented in terms of magnitude, but also introduced a very heightened level of volatility into the system, uh, which of course makes um, uh, forecasting in general and forecasting inflation in particular, particularly challenging. So for the UK, reflecting its, uh, it is a net importer of energy like uh, the Euro area, 
Um, this was not only a big cost push shock to inflation, but it also implied a big deterioration in the terms of trade. Um, that is the basic reason why we saw this squeeze on national income reflected in lower levels of consumption. And as President Lagarde said yesterday, I think it, it does threaten, even as those direct and indirect push, push effects on inflation dissipate, to propagate into second round effects as various actors in the economy attempt to catch up um, in, in terms of raising their real income after the, the consequences of their uh, the, um, uh, the shock uh, to energy prices and the deterioration in the terms of trade. Uh, so of course, from a forecasting point of view, the issue is it was clear to me on joining the bank that this shock was not anticipated, but there is a question about whether it was unanticipatable. And I took some solace from, but not much comfort, I have to say, from what I heard yesterday from Ida in the discussion around energy prices, uh, that energy prices are both difficult to forecast and likely to remain at least as, if not more difficult to forecast in the future. We have tried, as you can see in this picture, uh, assumptions based on both futures prices and random walk, and uh, neither has worked very well over the last year. So if we couldn't really have forecast that shock, and in some sense it wouldn't have been a shock if we could have forecast it, I think the challenge is more, do we have, as Giancarlo highlighted in the previous session, do we have a way of thinking about how that shock is gonna propagate, which is meaningful? Um, and I think that, that sort of gets to my second point. So the first thing I wanna say in that context is, as you can see here, the forecasts made by the MPC are conditional. So we are assuming some things and making forecasts on that basis. And that is an important source of why the forecasts may be poor predictors of the outlook, even if they are nonetheless useful bases for discussion in the policy committee. So uh, uh, some of the things we uh, condition on are the market implied path for our own policy rate. And I know Philip wants to talk about that in the discussion, so I'll hold my fire there. But we also um, produce forecasts conditional on announced fiscal policy and on um, the assumed path, which is varied through time, uh, on uh, energy prices. So of course, what I want to bring out is, is not just the sensitivity of the forecast to those assumptions, but also how important it is to understand the interaction among those assumptions. And I think the forecast we made last summer is, is quite uh, instructive in that respect, especially in the light of the fiscal discussion in the previous discussion, the session, and Christine's comments. So you might have thought that last August, assuming a random walk for energy prices, as is shown in the yellow line here, sort of locked in energy prices at a very high level, an implausible level, and that might have given you some cause for concern. You might also have thought that uh, at a time when we were going through political leadership changes in the UK, um, and there was no announced fiscal response to the rise in energy prices, that it was an implausible to assume that that would be the fiscal response at a time when, as we've seen, most European countries, other European countries, were introducing substantial fiscal interventions. But what I think was particularly unlikely is that you would have the combination of energy prices being at this very high level forever, and yet there never being a fiscal response. So the point I'm trying to bring out is it's the combination or interaction of the assumptions that matters. It's not just uh, one or the other. And I think that reflects the fact that it, it, as inflation moves substantially away from its target following such a big shock, the sort of everything else equal assumption that allows us to break down the contributions to the drivers of inflation in a linear way tends to become unworkable. And I think the sort of big example of that, which came up this morning and was discussed yesterday, is that the likelihood of second round effects entering the inflation process following an external commodity price shock is likely to be much stronger when there is a tight labor market. So if you like, the imp impact of the shocks is not just additive one on the other, but it has an important multiplicative component which means linear models are not very successful in addressing that. So that brings us to the sort of topic of yesterday's discussion around how we deal with nonlinearities. This also came up this morning in talking about convexity in the Phillips curve. 
and in particular the key question of whether these nonlinearities are asymmetric in character, whether they can explain why inflation goes on, up fast, but then also lead to the possibility that inflation gets stuck at that higher level rather than uh, coming back down towards target, and inflation demonstrates the kind of persistence that we fear. So um, what I'll conclude, and this sort of brings me to my third point, is just to sort of discuss how the bank staff is trying to address that problem, uh, trying to act in this humble yet nimble way that Alfred talked about, facing the fact that there may be behavioral changes in how uh, uh, different parts of the economy uh, set prices and respond to higher inflation. At a time when our benchmark models and our benchmark framework is based on the experience of the last quarter of a century of inflation targeting, a period when inflation expectations have remained well anchored, and we've seen lit little empirical uh, uh, experience of the type of propagation and inflation persistence that we're concerned about. So what are the sort of things that the bank staff have been doing? So I'll make a partial list. Um, so one of the things that's been suggested is that we draw on an ex empirical experience from the 1970s and 80s, which is an earlier period which does show this uh, higher level of more persistent and elevated inflation. And indeed, the story about the terms of trade and the higher narrow that may involve is very standard to the layered Nickel Jackman type of view of that period. But of course, lots of things have changed since the 1970s and 80s. The structure of the UK economy is very different, and the monetary policy uh, regime is, is changed. And inflation expectations respond to that, as we see in the very different behavior of long rates today than we had in the 1970s and 80s. So there's sort of a, uh, something you can learn, but it's not the full story. So I'm of an age now where my younger colleagues tell me, well, we have learned something in the 30 years since you were in graduate school when you were talking about those models. And so they emphasize the point that we should be looking at some of the more modern labor market literature coming out of the matching models, as was said earlier, emphasizing the ratio of vacancies to unemployment or job-to-job -job flows rather than the unemployment gap as measures of labor market tightness. I think that, again, is useful, and we have models in that direction which are helpful. But as I often tell uh, my younger colleagues, yes, we may have uh, learned something over the last 30 years, but maybe we've learned something about the last 30 years. And in fact, the experience now is one that is more akin. That's the mirror image to their critique of using uh, the older style, layered Nicole Jackman perspective. So then they respond, oh yes, what we can do then is use very modern techniques which focus on the very latest data using nonlinear machine learning techniques, neural networks, to try and explain the Phillips curve. Uh, that's all very fancy, but I think it runs the risk of overfitting essentially the one observation we have in a very nonlinear way, and then maybe applying that nonlinear model to a different domain where the conclusions could be quite questionable. So it's interesting, but I'm not sure it convinces me. But where I think we do have more scope is to try and use, as Alfred also said, some of the big data Silvana mentioned yesterday that we do have models that look at heterogeneity, heterogeneity uh, the tank model she mentioned. I think that's a helpful way of trying to have some more richness in inflation dynamics. Uh, and I know Philip wants to talk more about big data in the discussion, so I will hold off on that. But then I think finally what we also do um, is we do ask businesses and households themselves. Silvana summarized a lot of our work on surveys of inflation expectations but I just want to sort of pick up on what I thought was the excellent paper of Alberto and Francesco looking at state-dependent pricing. So just like the Banque de France, we also asked companies uh, about their pricing patterns. As you can see in this chart, as in France, the frequency of price changes has increased as we've entered this uh, 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 more volatile environment. We also ask firms, not quite in this language, whether they are state-dependent or time-dependent prices prices, and the fact that more of them say they're state dependent, and the fact as shown in this chart, that you see um, that those state dependent prices are reporting that they're raising prices more quickly than the time dependent prices, that's the kind of combination that would lead you to have the convexity in the Phillips curve that I think we're observing. The good news is, and I realize I haven't given a lot of good, lot of good news about forecasting in my uh, discussion here, but the good news is a little bit in line with Isabel's comments yesterday. 
When we ask those state dependent prices, what is their expectations for inflation next year, they predict lower inflation next year than the ones that are still time dependent pricing. So it does suggest that maybe there's more symmetry in the system and perhaps that can lead us to a little bit more of a sanguine view of where things are. So let me stop there. Thank you, Hugh, and the, the, the next speaker is Chiara Scotti from the Dallas Fed. Well, hello, everyone. I'm going to be the odd one out here, not just because I wear red, but because I'm going to change a little bit uh, the topic. In that, yes, I will be talking about forecasting because, after all, um, you know, the, this panel is about lessons from recent uh, experiences in macroeconomic forecasting, but I will be focusing more on uncertainty, um, what it means uh, to forecast in an uncertain economy, and I will bring in um, you know, the financial side uh, to understand uh, the macro side. And of course, because I work at the Federal Reserve Bank, I have to start with the usual disclaimer that these are just my views and do not represent the views of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. I think you will all agree with me that the past 15 years have truly been a collection of rare, rare events. Um, if we think about, uh, um, you know, the GFC reminded us about the importance of a stable financial system to a well-functioning economy, that is an economy with stable inflation and maximum employment. The recent banking stress um, made us ponder on the issue again. And then, you know, there was the pandemic, which was also a huge shock, surrounded by uh, a lot of uncertainty to the point that any of the uh, point forecasts were really like not useful. And then more recently, there has been really um, a lot of discussion about potential risks. And I think that between yesterday and today, we've talked about uh, a lot of those, um, including the probability of a soft landing versus a deeper recession. And so in this presentation, I'm going to take um, you know, again, just trying to be the odd one out, a different route, which is I'm not gonna tell you about the models that we use at the, at the Fed, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to use some of my research to think about uh, some of the issues that I think are important for policymakers. And uh, with the idea that uh, I believe my role and the role of, you know, the researchers at the Fed is to offer uh, models and alternative views to our policymakers to make their decisions. And so, um, in particular, I draw uh, on lessons from a recent paper that I wrote with Dario and Molly, a couple of colleagues at the Fed, to understand the links between macro and financial shocks and to study the role of uncertainty and tail risk. And I do have one slide of inflation because I understand that you guys are very interested about inflation, uh, but this is a framework that can also be used for inflation and it has been used for inflation. And um, I have a couple of slides about messages for policymakers. So in case I will wake you up at the end. <laughs> um, so um, the paper is, um, um, uses a model with just uh, two sides, two variables, GDP for the macro side and uh, corporate spreads for the financial side. Um, it's uh, estimated on uh, US data, but it can easily be applied to other countries, in including the European uh, Union and uh, the, European, um, the Euro area. And uh, um, I think that you know, even if I'm using data and uh, estimates for the US, um, the message should come across regardless of the, of the country. Um, let me just start with a couple of basic slides so that we are all on the same page. Um, think about the blue line as uh, the predictive distribution. So you're making a forecast, and instead of just looking at the point forecast, you have a distribution that is telling you how certain you are about uh, your forecast. Then look at the um, red line, at the red distribution. That is the distribution with uh, more uncertainty. So it's t telling you that uh, there is higher probability that your for forecast might actually end up uh, you know, on the tails, on the extreme parts of the distribution. Similarly, um, another thing that I think a lot of you have heard you know, over the recent year is this talk of tail risk. And in particular, 
what people in jargon have been calling shortfall and long rise. Um, tail risk is really giving information about the tails of the distribution, and so the shortfall is the left tail of the distribution telling you bad events, and the long rise is the uh, right tail of the distribution telling you about you know, good events in the case of GDP. And um, you know, the higher the tail risk, the more extreme events you can have. Why am I talking about both uncertainty and tail risk? Because uh, you know, they don't always move symmetrically. And so you know, it's not just the distribution getting wider, but the two tails can move in different ways so that you might have you know, very little change in the probability of good outcomes, but a big change in the probability of bad outcomes. And so what are the three lessons that I want to talk about today? One is uh, uncertainty and tail risks have secret variation. The second one is that financial shocks, not just macro shocks, have big downside risk to the macro outlook. And the third one is about uh, uh, the fact that the effect of shocks are stronger in period of high volatility. So first one, um, you know how I told you, if you look at the top uh, two lines, the left one is macro uncertainty, the right one is financial uncertainty. You know, when I showed you uh, the, um, the, those bell, um, those densities, uh, basically assume that at every point in time, we compute the forecast one year ahead, uh, you know, and we uh, take the, the measure of uncertainty that describes uh, our density, uh, and we plot it through time. This is what the top is showing us. The bottom is doing a similar exercise uh, but plotting through time our measure of shortfall and long rise. So what do we take out, uh, take away from this? If we look at the, at the top part, we see that uncertainty spikes uh, during recessions. Uh, so, you know, it changes over time. It's not always constant. And so, you know, we should pay attention um, when it changes. And then the bottom part shows that uh, um, GDP shortfall, so the negative outcomes, uh, actually move more than the positive outcomes. And so, um, again, you know, they both have cyclical variation. Lesson number two, uh, financial shocks uh, have a big downside risk, can have a big downside risk to the economy. And so, um, if you look at the um, black line, that is the forecast distribution as of uh, uh, the fourth quarter of 2008. And then within our model, we think about, uh, you know, shocking the system with either a macro shock or a financial shock. And so the blue and the red line give you uh, the predictive uh, distribution one year out under these two different scenarios. And you can see that uh, the financial shock is actually you know, almost as important, like it can have um, important consequences for the macro outlook. Third lesson, um, the effects of shocks can be stronger when volatility is high. And here, uh, what I'm plotting is uh, the impact of uh, um, a one standard deviation macro shock on the left or a one standard deviation financial shock on the right um, under on GDP growth under two potential uh, situations, one where volatility is low, the blue area, and one where volatility is high, um, the red area. And so you can see that um, there can actually be uh, significant differences in the way that uh, GDP growth responds to a shock, uh, depending on whether Volatility is low in the economy or volatility is high. So um, I told you that I would tell you something about inflation. My paper is about GDP and uh, uh, corporate credit spreads, but there are a number of papers out there, a number of frameworks out there that look at um, unemployment at risk, inflation at risk, and I, I'm just using uh, this, doesn't, this, this doesn't want to be a, uh, an academic presentation. I'm just using my paper because it was easy for me to pull those charts. Um, but the idea is really just to show you that when we are forecasting um, inflation in this case, um, 
it's really different. Uh, the, pr the predictive distribution, the forecast can be very different um, in different moments in time. And so here in particular, I can't see from here the colors and I don't have it on the screen, but there is one line which is uh, um, in 2022, uh, uh, right at the March 2022, right at the beginning of the hiking cycle in the US. And then the other one is as of the end of May. And they actually look very different with, uh, I believe is the yellow maroon one, uh, which is more shifted to the right, highlighting, you know, uh, the forecast for inflation that uh, you know would be uh, forecasted to be higher and uh, with higher um, uh, upside risks. So lessons for policymakers. Um, I told you that I would wake up everyone here, um, so this is the time. Um, just a couple of things that uh, I think my my model um, made me think about uh, that. I think should be important. The first one is really that policymakers and forecasters have to be mindful of the impact of financial shocks um, on the economy. And I think that you know we all agree uh, about this, and we were, as I said, reminded about this with the um, banking stress more recently. I think that so far there is probably been a disconnect be between credit tightening and corporate risk premia, um, in that normally. Um, the increase in lending standard is associated with higher uh, risk premia and the deterioration in uh, macro outcomes. But so far, the first link um, hasn't, has, re has been really muted. And so this also calls into question you know, the second part of the, the link. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think that we should all um, be reminded you know, when the, we're doing our uh, macroeconomic forecast that, that there is a financial sector out there uh, that can have uh, uh, important consequences um, on the macro uh, forecast. And then the second one comes from my lesson number three, where I was talking about the fact that um, the volatility environment uh, uh, can really amplify the fact that shocks uh, can have on GDP, on the economy. And so um, because of this, uh, um, I believe that it is really important uh, to uh, think of ways uh, to limit financial market volatility. And uh, in this sense, you know, macro prudential tools uh, um, ex ante and liquidity tools ex post, uh, you know, should really be thought as, uh, you know, the right answer to try to keep the volatility down um, because the, this volatility can have important consequences uh, on the macro outlook. And I conclude here. Thank you. So uh, that was quite intense o over those four uh, presentations. We, you obviously heard many common uh, observations or, or common uh, challenges facing forecasting. So uh, I want to give the panel the opportunity uh, to, to, to kind of respond maybe to, to three sets of issues, some of which you, you have taken up, but maybe it's helpful to ask three standard questions and then ask each of you to, to respond. One is essentially uh, exactly on this question about, about uh, the modeling of risk. For, for me, there's, there's two elements of that. One is how to model risk. Should it be to kind of uh, try and capture the full distribution, or should it be scenario analysis? And, and then the other side of it is how to communicate. So Hugh, that was very striking with the fan chart, and of course, uh, sometimes the fan chart said, well, it's so wide. It's so wide that uh, what are we really saying? But so how to communicate the intensity of uncertainty is, is I think, quite important. Uh, the second issue, which I think uh, ca came up quite a bit, was, um, you know, we should be learning institutions. How do uh, cent should central banks and other organizations incorporate uh, innovations such as the ready availability of, of big data? Now, we obviously have the example in the pandemic, the mobility indices were super helpful. Uh, it's super helpful to talk to um, public health officials and so on. But more generally, uh, the, do the noise to signal ratio when you go to high frequency uh, big data is, is maybe worth thinking about. And in turn, connecting to that is the role of uh, you know, replacing our, well not replacing, augmenting our staff with AI and machine learning. Um, uh, and then the third element I is uh, the, I, mean, I, I think uh, Claire, we have the same issue, uh, ours are projections. We project based on assumptions. 
and but sometimes that gets lost. That that, that gets lost. Uh, and and the, there are, there's a clear issue about projecting conditional on, on the fiscal response, and Hugh also highlighted that. Uh, but let me also, uh, given the diversity of the panel, and indeed uh, there's many forecasters in, in, in the room, uh, also from, from market, uh, the market side, is how to incorporate monetary policy. So I in our system, uh, we take the market yield curve. That doesn't necessarily correspond to what we think is going to be the policy path. Other central banks indeed have a joint uh, reporting of the, the, you know, that the forecast is conditional on the policy path that they expect. And obviously th there's pros and cons to each of those, but I don't know uh, whether na now among the panel members, but then uh, w when we open it up to the floor, uh, we can come to some of these issues. So let me just go in order and I'll come back to after it. All three at the same time? Yep. Okay. Uh, so on, 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 on the first one, uh, uh, we are doing pretty much the same as everybody else in terms of fitting uh, distributions uh, around our model forecast. We do that in a VO by shocking a G20 model. We do that in the GFSR uh, with a value at risk uh, exercise. But what we also now, uh, what we did before also, we had tail risk scenarios. And over the last two years, we added another tool, and that is uh, alternative uh, and plausible alternative scenario. Because we didn't quite know, for instance, how the Russia gas shock would, out, uh, would uh, work out, so we added a, 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 a scenario which was close to where we thought the baseline was, but it was not the, not the tail risk. And I think that is uh, hugely informative in terms of uh, the policy making part, because we are interested in using it for policy making, but it has been a, com a communication nightmare because the press is focusing on the baseline, the alternative uh, plausible scenario, they're not very different, and in the end, uh, it's difficult to communicate what we base our policy uh, on. On uh, your uh, a second point, uh, we have been using machine learning big data for a long uh, a time now. We use that for GDP now casting. We, we, we lose uh, satellite imagery. Uh, we are lose, uh, using Google search volumes. Uh, uh, we have a, a standard trade tracker, which is available to uh, uh, everybody. That was hugely helpful in the pandemic. That was also uh, of interest in, in tracing uh, Russian oil vessels. Uh, so we are doing uh, a lot in that, uh, at that space. We use that information in order to inform uh, us. It's an input, but it's not something what we necessarily base uh, our forecasts uh, on. Uh, country teams have that tool. Uh, they use that, uh, but it's not uh, a common, uh, common thing. But we are moving forward on that one in, in terms of uh, creating a big data roadmap. And uh, we want to create a, a big data center where we are uh, getting together with uh, uh, other IFIs policymakers uh, in, in order to exchange more information on how to uh, use uh, a big data for our purposes. And uh, on your last point, so maybe that is uh, of particular interest on how we are taking uh, the uh, monetary, uh, monetary policy response uh, in, in, into account. Uh, as you did, uh, Philip, uh, over the last uh, years, we did take the market yield curve uh, in, in terms of describing the policy rate. We stopped doing that in April uh, because uh, we concluded that uh, this market yield curve is not, plaus is not a plausible uh, policy rate, this is not what we expected the ECB to do. And so instead we used uh, a, a model with a Taylor rule, a, D a DSGE model, uh, in order to uh, project what we expect the ECB uh, uh, to do. And I think that was uh, a, 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 a much better way of uh, uh, coming out with, uh, uh, with, with our forecasts, uh, taking uh, into account the monetary policy side. And why is that important? It's important because uh, our big country forecasts are informing the rest of the universe, the 190 member countries. So if you are getting the big countries wrong, you are getting 190 countries wrong, and that's why we moved there. We have not uh, moved yet on the futures curve for energy prices. Uh, that is, uh, again, one of those things which people have been asking because that's what we have been taking into account and that has been a frustrating exercise as well. But on the monetary side, we did. Thank you, so Claire. Sure, thanks. Um, I guess on the 
spectrum between kind of standardized approaches and, and more flexible, I'd answer your questions in, in the more flexible space. So I think on the risk distribution question, I think it just depends very much in a sense what sort of shock or situation you are dealing with. So where we've had, you know, the shocks we've seen recently that have just been very different to what we've experienced before, very much sort of emanating outside the economic system, if you like, in that world, you're much better off using scenarios than you are doing a full kind of plan chart of the distribution of risks because you're just in a, a world where you know, a small number of very significant things will be affecting your, your results. If you think about the sort of very long period in which you know, inflation was, was low and we weren't experiencing those shocks, it makes much more sense to do a, a fan chart then and think about the whole probability distribution. But when your dominating issue is one or two particular factors, I'd make the case that you're, you're better off spending your time and your kind of intellectual effort on thinking through a couple of scenarios that can help you inform those decisions. On the big data question, um, I distinguish between kind of big data and machine learning, which I think people are using, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of that, and people are using um, quite effectively and increasingly from generative AI. I think those are, you know, slightly different things. On, the, on both, though, I would say that the, the noise to signal ratio is, going, is likely to rapidly change in the coming period, and so it is worth us thinking about and being open to how you can use that, and particularly the generative AI where it's very early stages that macro forecasters are thinking about it. But that is likely to change. We don't use that yet. We do use machine, machine learning. Um, and on the final question, I mean, I'm loath to comment about uh, the monetary policy decision-making to central banks. It's, it's a lot harder. The thing I would say is for a central bank, it is virtually impossible to get away from the fact that the entire world, the only, th you know, the dominating thing the entire world wants to take from the forecast is about the policy decision. Right? It's very hard to have any discussion, um, any sort of sophisticated discussion in which the, you know, all of the media, all of commentators are just trying to extract some signals about the policy decision. So it's completely different um, in the sense of if you're a central bank, what you assume about monetary policy and what you say about that, and you have to be incredibly careful about that. It's a, m a much easier situation you know, circumstance, to be honest, if you're, if you're outside that for us, for the IMF, for others, where, you know, no, no one's trying to interpret it in that, in that sense, and so we can be much more flexible. The important thing for central banks, obviously, is just to be incredibly clear in the communications, what is being assumed and what isn't. Over, oh, over to Hugh. Yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to echo and emphasize, I think, uh, what Claire just said. So, first, I'm not going to say anything about anything to do with the, the curve or the outlook for interest rates right now. Um, what I would say is, as you know, Philip, we have the same process, so we condition, as I said, on the market path of interest rates. I think our situation is slightly different from the ECB situation in that the MPC, so the policymakers, own and embrace the forecast uh, in a way that the staff is producing the forecast of the ECB. And that makes, if anything, intensifies, I think, the sort of set of issues that Claire was uh, referring to. Um, now, that is not to say that um, we might not want to look at ways of thinking about how to uh, reflect on our own reaction function and communicate that. But I think you probably have to place the forecast and the conditioning basis for the forecast in a broader assessment of how you're communicating about monetary policy. And it becomes crucial you have consistency across all those communication channels rather than just sort of change one piece without reflecting that more widely. Um, on your point about reflecting uncertainties more generally, again, I agree a lot with what Claire has said. Um, the history of the Bank of England has been to use the historical distribution of shocks to make some view of what the uh, reasonable bounds of uncertainty are, and then make some judgmental uh, adjustments to that. Um, if we are hit by you know, exceptional shocks, and maybe we've seen a period of shocks that are exceptional once in a century type shocks, I'm not sure that that historical distribution is necessary. And indeed, I think that's a little bit what Kiara was saying as well. Um, so I think there is a place in that context for more scenario analysis. And as I was trying to hint at is that once you move to being a long way from the steady state, I think the scenarios that we have published, for example, showing both random warp and full futures curve for uh, the evolution of energy prices, it becomes harder to just make that one change to a conditioning assumption because that's going to have a likely impact on other conditioning assumptions and that leads you to having to entertain, I think, 
how those are affected, and ultimately I think that does beg the question, is monetary policy really plausibly captured by, uh, even as a sort of neutral case, by the current market pricing? On big data, I mean, I agree with what's been said about you know, a lot of this is going along, there's a lot of promising there. I, I would have a little bit of a moment of caution from a central bank point of view. So if we think about what we're doing now, we're trying to learn using big data a lot from kind of cross-sectional information. That's where a lot of the richness comes. But the core issues for the monetary policy functions in central bank is really a time series dimension. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about inflation at the horizon where the lags of monetary policy decisions unwind. And we're talking in particular at the moment about persistence inflation, which is inherently a kind of slow moving time series concept. So if we are gonna find value in using these kind of cross sections, rich cross sections of data, I think we need to have models and the Hank and Tank and other types of models that Silvana hinted towards yesterday may be an example to that. We need to have models that provide a connection between cross sectional variation and what implications it has for time series variation. The, the other thing which is perhaps more a word of caution is um, there is a danger, I think, that the, the richness of some of these big data sets encourage you to kind of, if you lose your keys, to look where under the lamppost, right? So for example, it came up yesterday with um, John Wilbauer's comment about the UK mortgage market. We have very rich data on the UK mortgage market, loan by loan data. And so we can do very impressive calculations and modeling, to me at least, of what the cash flow impact of changes in mortgage rates will be and whether people are likely to refinance and are they likely to extend or repay early and those types of things. But maybe the bulk of households are not so constrained by those cash flow effects and they're already smoothing out. And we may be missing some of that big picture. Maybe some of the story of transmission through the housing market in a UK where the number of households with mortgages has declined quite significantly is now through the private rental market. And because we don't have these rich big data sets there, we're not looking necessarily in the right place for where the transmission is. So it, it's a little bit of a caution that you know, monetary policy makers, I think, need to recognize monetary policy is a macroeconomic game, it's a medium term oriented game, and it is about big macro trends, and we shouldn't be too ambitious in trying to understand every wrinkle in the economy. Okay, thank you. Sarah? Uh, I think I already spoke a lot about uncertainty, but a couple of things that I would like to add are that um, um, we have uh, a number of alternative scenarios that we look at um, and that we propose to our policymakers. And the idea is really that sometimes when there is a lot of uncertainty, uh, you have one scenario that you think is the most probable scenario, but you have other scenarios that you think, well, they might be just as probable as this one. So it's good to see uh, what these alternative scenarios would look like because the idea is really that the scenarios are a narrative to understand uh, how a shock would play out in the economy. And so, you know, under this lens, I think it is really important to have these alternative scenarios uh, and understand how uncertainty can play out uh, in different parts of the economy. Uh, regarding the second question about AI, ML, uh, and all of the um, connected things, I agree with everything that has been said so far. I have one um, or maybe two additional things that I would like to uh, bring up. One is that um, as an institution, it's always uh, um, important to keep in mind uh, um, the risks that come with uh, all of this. And so I just want to put that on the table because clearly uh, all, of, all of these new things are great, um, but they also come with risks. And then the second one is more an observation as a researcher, which, which is related to the fact that, uh, um, yes, there is the noise that you were talking about, the noisy signal, but there are also issues about you know, the causality uh, when you use this, this data and these uh, um, new techniques, uh, issues with uh, you know, standard errors, conference bans, um, and everything else that is related to these new techniques. Having said that, I'm the first one using textual analysis, uh, uh, machine learning uh, to trace out uh, how the uh, FONC communication spreads uh, through um, newspaper articles and Twitter. So, um, you know, of course you do what you can, and I think that there is a lot that researchers can do to use that. Third question was about uh, um, 
the um, forecast and whether whether to use uh, um, the market forecast versus the internal forecast. I think I'm coming at the question um, in a couple of different ways uh, because if I'm thinking about uh, the goal um, of the of using this forecast and the goal is really to inform policymakers, uh, then I think that it's actually good to show everything, every you know, like the internal forecast, how that would uh, how different. Um, uh, monetary policy path would influence uh, um, the macroeconomic forecast uh, as well as uh, you know using what what are the implications using uh, um, the market path if we think instead about uh, releasing it to the outside so then um, it becomes also an issue of communication with all the issues that were already raised and I think that uh, the, the Fed is in a slightly different position because the SCP is none of the above. Um, and so I'm not going to get into the issues of the ECP, but I just want to recognize that I think there are pros and cons uh, um, on both sides. V very good. So um, what, what I want to do is c collect a number of questions. Realistically, we're going to have one round. So I'll, I'll take a handful of questions and, and then uh, offer back to the panel. Uh, so uh, I'm biased looking that way at the moment, and I see Helen. So Helen first. Thank you very much, uh, great panel. So I have two points, one on machine learning and uh, one on climate. So on the machine learning side, so a lot has, has been said, but there are different ways of using machine learning techniques. So one has to do with big data and uh, the problems of that and the, but the potential also uh, uh, upside in terms of real time data, et cetera, have been emphasized. But another way of using uh, machine learning is about optimal model aggregation and allowing for uh, data generation process which are totally unknown, uh, updating uh, uh, optimally in real time the weight that one put, one put uh, on, uh, on each model. So allowing essentially for very uh, quick changes in structure uh, in the economy while maintaining you know, some, some models in order to do, to do forecasts. So this is different type of machine learning techniques which uh, could, I think, maybe be used a little bit more given that we are hit by very big shocks and where the structure of the economy may be changing quickly and we should be learning about that uh, at a learning rate, you know, which we should be uh, commensurate to those shocks. So I'm just putting that out there. That's a different type of use of machine learning which may be uh, a little bit underexplored right now. Uh, the second point on, uh, on climate, uh, so uh, I'm wondering how shouldn't we be thinking now a little bit more about how to incorporate the physical risk of climate. The horizons on, on, uh, on climate change have been shrinking uh, dramatically. Uh, so uh, how do our medium uh, term forecast or even short term forecast uh, incorporate now this increased uh, physical risks? Should we be thinking about that uh, in the, for monetary policy also potentially for all the analysis on fiscal sustainability? I'm a little bit worried that by underestimating this type of risk, uh, we are, you know, following policy paths which may not be as sustainable as we think, uh, and that we uh, are therefore under investigating in, in mitigation and adaptation. Th th thank you, Helen. So um, I see. Uh, okay, let me see. Scan the room, so I'll try and be uh, uh, comprehensive here. So, so please, uh, Andreas Willmeyer, I'm Bremen Howard. Um, I wanted to come back to the, uh, the point that Alfred made about the downsides of um, alternative scenarios. I remember in June 2020, the OECD produced a forecast or projection that had a second round of infections in COVID. I think as a consumer of official forecasts, that was incredibly helpful at the time because nobody had really talked about modeling that and given the, the lead time going into the publication, this was incredibly timely and very, very quick. So um, I think the point about worrying about the message being diluted is a fair one, but I think there's also a, a messaging of thinking about a number of um, potential scenarios that in particular in this sort of uh, circumstances is really quite useful um, for international organizations, but also you know, uh, policymakers alike. So I, I, um, I understand that you, have, you run the risk of saying too much too often, but occasionally I think there's a very good case for doing these alternative scenarios. Okay, um, so, so if, um, if you come over, staying in, in the middle here to Fernando here. 
Thank you. Um, so taking maybe the cue from Madame Lagarde and trying to look forward uh, a little bit, you all know that uh, forecasting is an important part of our central bank decisions. Um, would you say that our usual workhorse models, the one we, we have been used, we're using for a long time, but incorporating the pandemic years, they are safe to be trusted again? Um, as policy is being tightened across the board and unusual shocks are fading, we might be entering this more normal phase of the, um, of the economy, or should central banks be moving towards larger and more complex models, such as the one from Bakai and Farhi? Um, they are macro network models, they have a lot of detail, uh, but, and they might uh, portray better the unusual developments that happened, but they possibly might have a worse forecasting outcome under normal circumstances. So I would love to hear okay. from you. Okay, thank you. Can you just pass the mic to Richard, just in front of you here? Thank you. Um, a, first, a quick comment on uncertainty. I was a bit struck by Dara's uh, first chart. It seemed to show no increase in uncertainty uh, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Uh, and uh, when I, uh, I used to teach uh, my students uh, on the, on, about uncertainty using the fan charts, the famous fan chart from the inflation report of the Bank of England. And before, you know, I flash up a fan chart from say 2007 and a fan chart from say 2011. And they'd say, oh, well, they look pretty much the same. And I'd say, wait, wait a minute, look at the scale on the vertical right. axis, okay? And of course, it had widened very, very considerably. Um, a question uh, for uh, both Alfred and Claire. Um, the forecasting in a multinational context uh, is subject to uh, a, to some extent, a negotiation of discussions, mm -hmm. shall we say, with individual country representatives. And one might think that this could introduce an upward bias in the forecast. You didn't show any um, uh, charts that indicated the average, not absolute error, but the average error of forecasts. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you would find that if you look at the, the forecast errors, that they have some degree of bias upwards, possibly because of the efforts of individual country representatives to say, oh, things aren't as bad as you think they are. So uh, I think, Richard, you're referring to the GDP forecast, probably yeah. not the inflation forecast. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh uh, I, am, I am indeed. Uh, and I have to just, uh, just pass the, the mic right behind you there. Okay, please. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations for this panel. I didn't hear explicitly to uh, talking about two issues. First, uh, the role of money as a leading indicator. BIS has published uh, recently a piece saying that had you used uh, the money gap as an indicator, forecast errors would have been much uh, lower. And second, expert judgment. Maybe it was implicit in this scenario analysis and so on and so forth, but could, could you, is no particular adversity. <laughs> what are okay, the lessons okay. that you take on both? Thank you, thank you. And in, in my theographical sweep uh, in this direction, uh, Lars Benson. Sorry, the front, front row for the mic. Um, there is an inherent consistency from a policy point of view on uh, making inflation forecasts conditional on market interest rates, the market uh, uh, forecast of the policy rate, especially when the MPC owns uh, the inflation forecast, because the MPC may know that it will actually follow a different path for the policy rate than the market interest rate. This means that the inflation forecast conditional on uh, the market interest rate is not the best inflation forecast uh, because uh, the market forecast is not the best forecast of the policy rate. The solution is completely obvious, namely that the MPC or the executive board agrees on a policy rate path 
and, and the, con the inflation forecast and other forecasts are conditional on that policy rate path. And this is what uh, already Norges Bank and uh, the RBNC and uh, the Riksbank and to some extent uh, the Fed is, is already doing and it works perfectly well. So I think uh, that is still something to be done to, to for MPCs uh, and executive boards to make a joint forecast for the policy rate and publish it too. Thank you, Lars. And then I'll, I'll just uh, take John Mubar and then Michaela at the very end. Yes, I wanted to ask the panel um, what their view was on uh, the use of the rational expectations or model consistent expectations, which has been a very popular idea in economics for a long time. But how do models that incorporate model consistent expectations handle the, the big structural breaks that we've been talking about um, in the last two days? Okay, very good. Uh, and then finally, if you bring the mic to Michaela in, in the corner at the far end. So thank you for, for very interesting presentations. Um, I, I wanted to ask two questions. First of all, when I look at the consensus, what really strikes me is that the uncertainty shows up, if we're looking at the standard deviation, it shows up in different points over time. So first it shows up in GDP, then it shows up in inflation, and then it shows up in uncertainty on rates. And I wonder if, if uh, that's something we should think about more as a kind of early warning on uncertainty and, and think about how that can play out. And the second thing that, that really strikes me is that what we've been through is a, a tremendous sectorial shock. And I wonder if we shouldn't be, uh, especially as we're looking ahead to things like climate change, biodiversity, um, if we shouldn't in our forecasting be placing much more emphasis on sectorial models rather than just focusing on, on the macro side. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, it, many uh, of those contributions were some mix of a question and a comment, uh, but, but I will uh, invite each uh, panel member to see if, if they, they want to, to uh, answer or respond in any way. So I'll go in reverse order this time. So Chiara. We are already negative time, so I'll try to be brief and maybe try to find a common thread through uh, the questions. And so I think that a lot of those questions were related to um, really the models that have been used, uh, how they fare out during the pandemic and after that. Are they still good models? Should we look at sectoral models? Um, I think that, I mean, we are all having this conversation today exactly because we recognize that there is room for improvement and we're all trying to figure out what are the best ways uh, uh, to do forecasts going forward. Um, I do think that uh, um, it is important to continue to look at the different set of models and also you know, going back to the machine learning. I think that it can definitely be useful. Um, there is just a lot that we need to explore and I'm sure that everyone at the different central banks will do that, will, will continue to do that going forward. questions, uh, which I can't give do justice to. I think, I think there's a sort of interesting um, balance to be kept between trying to look for new techniques and new methods, and by implication giving up on some old techniques and old methods, um, in order to address the problems that Helene was talking about, the need to be nimble in the face of big structural changes. I think that also a bit addresses John's question. But I mean, from a monetary policy point of view, I think there are also benefits in trying to seek out what you might call eternal verities, because if they really are eternal, they are reliable, and they can be quite a good basis for policy over the medium term. And in the end, as I said earlier, monetary policy is a medium term business. Um, so I think that finding that balance um, is a difficult one. It does go a little bit to the question about money. Uh, I mean, there are those. Um, I smiled when you said you were not directing that question at any individual, well, no. <laughs> given our history together. But uh, the, um, the, the, I think there are there is a case for seeing money as providing some view into nominal trends in the economy, which I think 
central banks should be concerned about. And that's not necessarily a popular view with all members of the MPC. <laughs> I look at my boss when I say that. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's something I think we should keep in mind. Um, and then just finally, and a bit related to that, I do think it's important, um, while taking Lars's comment, and I, I basically agree from a logical point of view with what he said, but the role of central banks and central bank forecasts is not necessarily to produce the best forecasts. The role is to support the best monetary policy decision, which brings inflation back to target. And I think that does lead you to a whole set of issues about how you organize your discussion internally, which was part of what we discussed. Um, and you allow that role for judgment, which I think is necessary, that role to have many different models and dev many different analytical frameworks to help you have a robust and resilient view. Um, and then ultimately, how you convert that into a way of communicating with the public um, and financial markets. Um, I mean, monetary policy and indeed economic policy making more generally can have an effect on behavior which supports what you're trying to achieve. And internalizing that benefit is one that's pretty key to having a framework which just doesn't put accurate forecasts in some abstract sense on a pinnacle above, I think, what the real uh, importance of the underlying process is. Thank you. So over to Tara. Sure. I mean, great, great set of questions. I'll just make two comments, I guess. One is picking up a couple of the questions around climate, which I think we all agree is something we all will need to think about more and factor in more, not just the physical risk that Helene talked about, but there's also huge uncertainties around what that will do to energy prices in terms of how the transition will flow through and the shocks there, and also um, the cost of technology, well, te the rate of technology adoption and the cost of technology, huge uncertainties that we need to factor in. The challenge in monetary policy space is how to do that over the time horizon. You know, monetary policy forecasting tends to be shorter time horizons than some other some other forecasters do, and so thinking about how to do that. One, um, a, you know, a, a definitely sectoral models will help, right? And they're definitely going to need to be part of that. The other thing I'll just to, to pick up briefly on, on Richard's point about is this different if you're in an international organization versus a, an authority? I mean, the data on that is, you know, we're no better or worse. If you look at the errors over time, um, you know, no better or worse. Now, that doesn't mean that members aren't having a, a, an impact, as I said in my presentation, I've, I've sat on both sides of this. I can tell you for sure, countries don't agree with the, with the forecast. Sometimes they really don't agree. Um, it could be the, the, the case that international organizations are affected by, by member views, but if that's true, something else is then affecting authorities, because like I say, we're no worse or, or better at forecasters. But I mean, you know, stepping back, in a sense, everyone doing a forecast, there's a risk there of, of bias, right, of um, optimism bias in those forecasts. I mean, at the end of the day, we are still, they are still all done by humans, and so there's a kind of human nature element to all of it, but there's no, there's no sort of consistent, consistent um, error there. Yes, uh, just to add on uh, uh, Hugh's point on uh, robust forecast for policy making, uh, that, that is in the end the, 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 the point. We want to provide a basis for uh, good policy making and avoid cross errors. And therefore, point forecasts are useful, and uh, plausible alternative scenarios are uh, re required. You need to look at tail risks, and you need to be open to use many, many tools, especially in a time of structural change, including when it comes to uh, climate change. And that uh, means you need to have expert judgment on how you put uh, all of this together. To Rich's point, uh, we are not negotiating our year forecasts with uh, country authorities, and as you saw, uh, the forecast errors are scattered around uh, uh, zero. Uh, but it might be a question is uh, when we are doing fund programs uh, because uh, they are negotiated and therefore, of course, the forecast relies on the implementation of the policies which were agreed. Uh, uh, that, that could be, uh, uh, there was a question uh, in the past. And the final point I want to make and should have made before, uh, we uh, failed or were too slow to understand the persistence of inflation on the way up. Uh, we should be careful uh, and not overcompensate. Whenever you make errors, uh, we are prone to overcompensate. So on the way down, uh, we should be open to uh, that that persistence uh, may not exist and uh, it may not be symmetrical. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm not going to try and s summarize the panel. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. I, I hope it's been a helpful uh, 
uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I could spend a lot of time giving the ECB view, but uh, time has run out. <laughs>